to uh, give you an update on that for the local Scotland concert. But, uh, I can speak to some authority because I'm on the board of the ASO. And uh, when we were talking about the marketing of it, uh, we thought, well, what do we do? The place is going to be full of 3,000 Scotsmen. And that is the reason that nobody else was there. <laughs> <laughs> Next week you're in trouble. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Philip Speakman as our guest speaker today. Philip, um, I think, needs a little introduction to quite a lot of people here uh, in this club because one of his main claims to fame is that he's in fact a past member. Uh, sometime back in the 14th century, I think it was. Anyway, I've suggested to him that uh, everything old might be new again at some stage. Um, that, that is certainly his principal claim to fame, claim to fame but uh, apart from that, he has, as many of you will know, uh, a stellar career in, in marketing and recruitment. Uh, he graduated from Hello University in Humanities, specialising in marketing, and then went on to hold senior positions in uh, 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 Mobile and, and um, uh, Touche Ross, before forming his own uh, firm, Philip Speakman and Associates, uh, sometime after that. That uh, firm, as I'm sure you will know, uh, became one of the most successful organisations of the kind in Australia. Indeed, at one stage, uh, the, the firm from a space at Adelaide was recruiting something like 10% of, uh, or was making some, something like 10% of all the senior placements in Australia. Um, so, I think that speaks for itself. Uh, Philip is now the chairman of Morton Phillips, and uh, in that capacity, still undertakes uh, some recruitment work at, at the most senior level. And uh, perhaps his most recent success is that he was responsible for recruiting uh, Andrew Daniels, who was announced recently as the successful <coughs> candidate as the CEO of the LA Global Stadium Management Authority. Um, so that, uh, and, and that went after a worldwide search to a lot of the board, or essentially a lot of the board. So, without further ado, I'd like to ask you to welcome to the rostrum, please, Bill Speakman, to speak to us on the subject of, um, in particular, the looming skills shortage in Australia and the changing workplace environment. Thank you, Chairman Chris, thank you very much for a very warm welcome. And it's lovely to see so many familiar faces. I won't say old faces, but that'll give me and those people away. I must confess a slight disappointment being back in this venue. I was a member of Rotary when it was at the old Hotel Australia. And I'm fortunate enough to live there these days. And I honestly believe, as uh, Sir Eric Neal and Ian Renton and others, would back me up on this, the view is far better from there than it is from here. I'm sorry about that wall, it's disappointing. We're reading almost daily about the boom in the mining industry and what it's going to do to, to our labour, the availability of labour. And I say to many of you, who are probably sitting there thinking, well, it's not going to affect my business, better think again, because it will affect your business. And judging by the age group of this group, those of you who have retired may be on other organisations as directors or have influence in family companies. So what I'm about to say today is still as relevant as if you are executives in a, in a business. So the aim of today's paper is to give you a, a brief description of why we're going to have these problems. And then I'm going to give you an 11 point strategy plan as to what I think you can use in your own businesses to help you overcome these, these problems. Well, this is it in a nutshell. We've got massive urbanisation happening for the north of Australia and China and India. And all of the research indicates that despite troubles globally, these two countries aren't slowing down. They may slow down by 1%, but the, but the momentum is unstoppable. It's a tour de force. 
and that has created uh, a huge opportunity for, for mining. This is the resource that they need to urbanise their economies. And the challenge for Australia, it's going to be a rare once in a million year opportunity if we can combine the availability of capital with the availability of labour, we will ride uh, an unbelievable boom. Bottom point's relevant. This is happening at a time when our migration intake is falling. Which will create a huge demand for jobs at a time when the availability of labour simply isn't there. The world is really wanting and looking towards Australia to step up, to dig out of the ground these essential commodities and resources so that these other economies can in turn grow. But this is coming at a time when our government policies have seen a reduction in migration. We have, and many of you here are baby boomers, I certainly are in that category. Uh, many of us are retiring, and certainly within five to eight years we'll be retired. And this is the biggest bubble of population that this country's ever seen disappearing out of the workforce. The demand for workers from the resources sector and related sectors will all be affected. So as the mining demand builds momentum, it will suck labour out of other non-mining companies. And the downstream effect of organisations in construction and other supplier groups will be greatly affected. This will in turn mean the supply and demand curve will be a shortage of labour that will create inflation with wages. The inflation in wages will in turn attract people out of non-mining sectors to go into mining. And the point of what I'm saying here, those of you that understand this and move quickly now will be the best to take advantage of this once in a lifetime opportunity. So, the first of the strategies. We have for the first time in the last 15, 20 years, many students coming to this country. The Chinese universities are full, and many of the bright young Chinese cannot get entry to their own university, so they come south to Australia and they go to the UK, Canada and the US. But here's a, a ready-made pool of labour that we are not harnessing terribly well. I'm sure if I asked for a show of hands in the room, many of you would have experienced being in a taxi in Adelaide with an Indian or Chinese taxi driver and having a chat with them and they've just finished a master's degree in IT or a PhD in computing sciences and they're driving cabs. So, somehow in this current environment we've got to learn to help and assist these people. I think uh, the third bullet point there, the, uh, we've got to get better at engaging with students, we've got to chase them harder, we've got to make them feel more important. There's a number of suggestions there that uh, I've mentioned, uh, apprenticeships, cadetships, internships, research grants and other cooperative programs. Changing the dynamics between business and education, I see Frank O'Neill sitting here, former Adelaide University star, um, is a real challenge because universities have traditionally seen themselves as places of education and not places of vocation. So there's huge change going through our entire system to try and produce a pool of labour which can meet the demands of industry. So the bottom point is true, we've got all these overseas students attracted to Australia, we've got to get much better at retaining them. Strategy two, this is a relatively new concept and it's been enabled by the power of the internet. It's called crowdsourcing. And it's really seeking solutions to complex problems by putting the problem on the worldwide web and allowing people with interest and stimulus to come forward and give solutions. I'll give an example of what I'm talking about. There was a very successful publicly listed gold mining company in Canada that had done a huge amount of geological mapping. It was starting to run out of its primary mines, running short of gold. So what it did, it put this problem on the world wide web using this technique called crowdsourcing and in a matter of four or five weeks, a number of geologists from around the world, at no charge to this company, were able to come up and solve the problem. They had access to the, the maps and they were able to use that 
knowledge and their technology and skills to solve a very complex problem. The mind has since gone on from strength to strength. Our increasingly connected world has created this opportunity. The technology is here to use. Unfortunately, most of us still don't know how to use it properly. Companies can access this pool of talent globally and internationally. And that's how we want to start thinking. Distances to world markets, and Australia is the most affected of many of the Western economies, is causing us a, a definite lag in GDP. So using the net gets rid of that tyranny of distance that Blaney talks about. We can tap very quickly in a nano second into overseas information, advice and skills. This uh, is a different concept, it's probably better known as outsourcing and the early examples of this was the call centres that were going offshore to parts of Asia, India etc. And I think because of some of the awkwardness of those early call centres, this particular technique initially has got a bad reputation. I suggest you should revisit it. It's absolutely designed to take advantage again of skilled labour and as Ken Henry noted, Australia has much to gain from offshoring, most obviously lowering the cost to business and consumers by transferring those job functions to cheaper labour offshore, which will allow the remaining labour in this country to focus on value-add jobs. Again, you can see it's an ideal application for traditional back office functions such as IT, banking, finance, those types of, of chores. The economic benefits of offshoring becomes even more attractive to business as education levels in the other countries, as they rapidly middle class, become more abundant. Look at that last bullet point, the numbers are quite staggering. As Australia's uh, working age population will grow by a piddling 1.2 million, we have in China 18 million and a staggering 133 million in India. We'd be mugs not to tap into that later. Strategy four, the old chestnut, immigration. Skilled migrants can, as we know, provide an instant dividend. We've tried them in the past. We had the Italians and the Greeks in the 50s and 60s, and by golly, what wonderful contributions they made to this country. Our training and education system, as I've touched upon, simply isn't producing enough labour quickly enough to satisfy the demand. So we've got to revisit immigration. Chris Byrne has said that uh, it's absolutely crucial. The old debate of suggesting migrants still jobs is rubbish. They actually contribute very generously to our GDP. And the government's finally recognising this by fast-tracking and streamlining. And again, Frank O'Neill, I know, has been heavily involved in aspects of, uh, of migration. Now, here's a pun for all you people in this room. Sorry, I shouldn't say all of you. For many of you in this room, don't bloody retire. There's plenty of jobs out there still. Go back to your former employer and see if you can get your old job back. Why? Because we're going to lose all these people, putting you around the room, There's many very fit people sitting here, and look at the facts. Mature age workers, the most experienced and reliable, lowest turnover, fewer sick leave days, and best safety record. So why wouldn't you keep them on? And when they leave, a lot of industry experience goes with them. And that's where a business can be really hurt. I see David Seaton over there. I'm staggered to find out that Price Waterhouse, one of the big four accounting firms in Australia, have a retirement age of part of 55. Absolute rubbish. Older workers have this capacity, wisdom and experience to mentor the younger workers. This is something they do very well in Asia and very well in Europe. We are very poor at this in this country. And that's true, the departure of the old experienced employee with all that knowledge and wisdom means clients feel 
less comfortable to uh, stay with the firm. 55 to 70 years is a massive untapped source of productive capacity. And again, I think forward thinking employees will recognise that and try and retain these people as best they can. So, strategy six. Where are the women? While men and women are equally represented in the workforce, at the start of their careers, women's participation rates as we understand, through maternity, drops dramatically. Australian women are more likely, sorry, more highly qualified than men, but they're less likely to be in the workforce from that age group. Goldman Sachs have estimated that GDP could be increased by a staggering 13% if we had higher female participation. For business to draw women fully into the workforce, there needs to be a whole lot of initiatives taken to satisfy the demands on women with raising children, but retain them in that workforce. In the end, tapping into Australia's hidden resources of women will be less about policies and more about aligning systems. This is a great example. Free Hills, the big legal firm in Sydney, have worked very hard to address this issue, and they've taken female partnership from 16% to 22% in a five-year period, six-year period proving that it can be done. Strategy seven, looking between the cracks. Now these are people who have already worked for existing organisations. They're right there under our noses. And many of these people are overlooked. We've got really three distinct categories. We've got the Indigenous Australians, and we're seeing the smarter mining executives such as uh, Twiggy Forrest and Robert Champion decrepit when he was involved, and many more now, Clive Palmer, etc., are harnessing the Indigenous labour. We've also got um, huge numbers of these people unemployed. We've also got a lot of immigrants that have got degrees from overseas that are not recognised in Australia. As a result, they are working in jobs that are way below their capacity. Again, there's a waste of resource, an opportunity cost. Also, there are people on disability support pensions. And we've seen the success of Bedford Industries here in Adelaide to see how those people can be mobilised and harnessed to do very good things. So there's another strategy where, right under our nose, there are people that are available. I think the problem is, in, is identified that last bullet point. We seem to be stuck with a one-size-fit-all approach, rather than thinking outside the square. Strategy eight, the old chestnut of increasing productivity. Pro productivity is a measure of how much each available work contributes to the economy while they are at work. Interestingly, our productivity has been falling, declining since the 1990s. Companies that boost productivity by embracing technology and sound decision making based on data, more efficient processes, can certainly do a lot to beat the skills crisis. Our productivity is largely a consequence of the way we configure our work. And companies with better systems and processes, and it really comes back to management, will be the winners. Strategy nine, develop existing staff. And training has been one of those areas that's been very hardly hit during the GFC. It's, seen, it's been seen to be too expensive and a waste of money. But as I'm contending with this paper in the next five years, training's got to come back in a very large way to take advantage of the existing skill set. Again, getting workers into the right frame of mind requires a nurturing environment, and training's a, a large part of that, and culture, which will provide opportunities for skills development and an engaged management team. By gaining broader experience across the business, individuals learn more about their employer, and basically you'll get a far better productivity from that individual. Companies can harness individuals' potential by creating options for them to move along non-traditional paths, We've seen some of the big American companies such as uh, Microsoft and Google who've reinvented workplace reform to give people far greater stimulus and extend productivity beyond normal working hours. In fact, most of the employees in those organisations don't even regard eight hours as being a working day. They just come and go and achieve their targets accordingly. 
Strategy 10, succession planning. We've all seen examples of where this has got terribly wrong, evidenced by the Liberal Party not that long ago. This is an area where the next generation needs to be nurtured and brought to the fore, but to be balanced off with what I said earlier about retaining older staff members who are very experienced. The younger ones won't necessarily warm to that. So managing the transition is very productive, mismanaging it is very, very costly. I think early planning avoids the, the uh, common problems with this and being bold enough to actually put it on paper and commit to it. It takes innovative leadership, succession planning and career strategies that keep younger employees from leaving. And unfortunately we're seeing in the workforce today far too much turnover amongst the, the 20 to 25 year olds. Huge costs to the companies that employ them. So making better use of older workers is the important potential solution to the schools crisis, but getting this careful balance between retaining the youth and retaining the older, more experienced worker. That's going to be the challenge going forward. And finally, strategy 11, create a performance-based culture. The challenge really is for the CEOs to getting all employees to commit to delivery. So how do they do that? Well, there's three things that stand in the way. People do not see themselves as part of the whole organisation and therefore do not have a strong sense of belonging. People are not committed to the specific goals of the organisation and they do not have a strong sense of belief in what the organisation is trying to achieve. And thirdly, people do not have a common understanding of how they are supposed to behave to complete the task. That, in a nutshell, is good versus bad management. So Chris, wherever you are, uh, that concludes the fourth part of the paper. I'd be very welcoming in uh, trying to deal with some questions that might come off the floor. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, are there questions from the floor? Frank. Frank. Uh, thanks for it. That was an excellent presentation. And that, uh, I find the very good analysis and some potential solutions. Uh, I, I agree with you that there are future labour needs that could probably be provided by people like us that are in transition to retirement, uh, but will also be provided by uh, migration. Now, for Australia, this is, is quite a challenge because we have our own Australian culture, and if we absorb uh, future uh, migrants, they're likely to come from Southeast Asia, China, or Europe has the same problems as Australia, an aging population, uh, population is dropping. So I wondered if you had thought about what's the optimum rate of absorption of migration from foreign cultures into Australia and how that might be overcome. Yeah, look, it's a very good question. The, the biggest single problem that we're seeing with the Asian cultures is they simply really struggle to integrate into our culture. Um, hear about these kids that come from wealthy families and they go to Saints or PAC and they spend their whole life sitting behind a computer screen. They don't play sport, they don't mix with the Australian kids, they go back home to their homeland and they've really picked up nothing except some technical know-how. Um, so I think as a society we've got to work much harder to embrace these people, to bring them to our communities and to really spend a lot more time training and helping them because they really struggle they are very left brain in the way they view the world. Left brain is all about facts and numbers, so they're great mathematicians, doctors, scientists. Right brain, getting on with people, emotional intelligence, very poor. And that's the skill they need to integrate. Without that proper integration, they will struggle. So it is going to be a huge conundrum that we've got to work on. No short term solution to that one, Frank. Hey, sir, Philip, uh, thank you for the presentation. Two observations briefly that you might like to comment on. I'm aware that we both watched Q&A on Monday night and we saw uh, one of the Labor power brokers, a strong unionist talk, and it beggars belief that the language still coming from the union movement is really pricing, us, pricing Labor out of the equation for Australian business. That's one question uh, or comment that you might like to make. The second one is our youngest son is a production worker at uh, the Warfare Destroyer Project. 
And he has observed a lot of his mates, boilermakers and so on, are actually people who've worked in the mines but actually have made a lifestyle choice to come back to, in this case, Adelaide, to, uh, to bring up families and not shoot off for three weeks at a time. And that strikes me as being an interesting potential market as one of your, part of one of your strategies. Would you like to comment? Uh, Ted has asked me two questions. The first is the, uh, the cost of the, uh, the labour for the mining boom, and the second one is whether people uh, can sort of go in and out of the mining industry. Uh, I'll take the second one first. This is causing a real problem. It's called FIFO and, and uh, DIO. It's drive in, drive out, and fly in, fly out. Now, this is not what we want. We don't want, with Roxby Dance, people in boarding planes in Melbourne or Queensland and flying in, working here for a few days taking your money and going back. So we've got to work hard to negotiate with the, uh, the various companies and do all we can to get the benefits of people living and working in <coughs> South Australia. First part of Peter's question, yes, it's very inflationary. We're at the short-term lift-off stage. We're reading about train drivers getting up to $200,000 a year. Rio announced a few days ago they're going to try and get trains that don't need train drivers. So there's going to be a real battle going on, but there's no doubt the union see this current crisis is a huge opportunity to uh, reap, as our governments, a lot of money out of the mining boom. So watch the space. Uh, there's going to be a lot of industrial action, industrial unrest in this country over the next few years. So shouldn't our government be trying to entice, say, Indians that have got <coughs> similar British culture to ours, rather than taking all these migrants from the Middle East they have to pray five times a day and knock off and, and they just don't fit in anywhere that I've seen around Sydney and, and New South Wales where we've got a big population. Uh, John, that's a good question. The, 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 the scary fact is though, that we can take labour from anywhere in the world, we still may not have enough labour for this coming boom. It's going to be that big. But certainly the Indians with the British Raj colonial governance understanding are probably more likely to fit here as are people from Singapore and Hong Kong. That the, the other, you're talking about Muslims and, and other countries that don't share our philosophies, they are the harder cases where we've got to work much more diligently to help them integrate into our society. One last question, David. David. Yes, Philip. Uh, Australian workers generally are not very mobile. In other words, they don't move from state to state. One of the reasons for that would be the extremely high cost of moving house, moving schools, moving hospitals, and so on. Stamp duty, for instance. If you sell a, car, uh, sell a house in South Australia and buy one in West Australia, the stamp duty costs, for instance, are horrific. There's got to be some, some way of easing that pain if you want to keep, if, if we want to get a more mobile workforce. Do you agree? Yes, I do. And these are the sorts of issues that are in the infancy uh, which governments are now having to address. Yeah, it's just a, a massive change coming to the way this country is operated. Uh, huge opportunities, but huge challenges to go with it. Criterions, uh, I'm sure you agree with me, we've heard uh, a most stimulating and um, a most stimulating address and one which is clearly based on a huge amount of uh, experience uh, in every aspect. So Phil, thank you very much uh, for your attendance today and for your address and we'll ask you to take with you this very small token of our appreciation and our esteem. Thank you.